Hello, and welcome to season two of the Revenue Marketing Report powered by Caliber Mind. Our goal on the RMR is to help marketers move from subject matter experts to strategic business partners. I'm your host, Kamala Thompson, and today I'm thrilled to introduce Mike Minard. Mike, please introduce yourself a little bit. Hi, Kamala. Thanks for having me on the podcast. So I'm Mike. I run a B2B agency in the UK. Um, we're what I think people call um, full service. So we uh, cover a range of things. Um, and we really think about content development and then content distribution as being our goals. So we have to create stuff that's going to engage your audience. Um, and then obviously we have to get that in front of them. Um, and that can be done through a whole range of different ways. So we might create video content or we might create written content. And then we might, um, you know, directly send content to people through email, for example, or social. Or alternatively, we might be running PR campaigns. So that's kind of our philosophy. We work across Europe. Um, we also do some work outside of Europe as well for, for some of our more specialized clients. But really, the thing about us is we really care about our customers. And our customers are all selling basically geeky stuff to geeky people. That's kind of my summary of it, um, which means they're selling something very technical to someone who's making a decision that is fundamentally based on technical benefits. And so that requires a very special kind of marketing that I'm sure we'll talk about as we go through. Wonderful. So our topic for today is something that's near and dear to all of us, particularly since 2020, and that is how to reach people now that everybody is remote. So I'm remembering back in the day when I was supporting marketing teams, the primary spend and a lot of our activity was dedicated to these giant trade shows. And for those of you who don't know what a trade show was, it's where people got into a room with other people and we shared the same air and uh, passed viruses like crazy. I think it was called like the crud every time <laughs> something went around some huge conference. And I love that you're working primarily with Europe. What have you seen primarily uh, really hook people's attention and draw them in when it comes to digital? Well, I think absolutely you're right first to say digital because reaching people at home is very different from reaching people when they're at a physical location um, that you know. So that physical location could be a trade show, as you mentioned, or it could also be, for example, their place of work where now, you know, not everybody's going into work and certainly not going into work every day. So sending that classic postal mailer in probably doesn't work as well as it used to. So it's all about uh, digital and finding the digital channels that work for your particular um, clients. And I'd say, that a lot of the challenge is really finding out what data you have. One answer, you know, might easily be, well, we want digital ads. You know, let's let's go place ads in trade magazines. Well, if your audience isn't reading those trade magazines, you pick the wrong trade magazine. That's not going to work. It doesn't really matter whether your audience is is at home or in the office. It's not going to work. Equally, you could say, oh well, okay, forget about that. We're going to send emails to them. If you don't have the email address then again, you're going to be stuck. So a lot of it is about building a strategy rather than picking a particular tactic. And that strategy is around deciding how you're going to reach people and then how you're going to get that data that you need to reach those people. And to me, that's probably more important than just picking the tactic first off. Yes. And we all know I love data. So we will dig into first party data shortly. I do, however, want to spend a couple minutes talking through which tactics do and don't work in terms, for example, webinars. We all have Zoom fatigue. We're tired of being on meetings. What are you seeing work and not work? Like the thing that pops into my head, is email really dead? <laughs> yeah, great question. So we've dismissed Zoom, we've dismissed email, two of the most effective channels for most B2B marketers. And I think, you know, everybody wants to hype things up by saying, you know, email's dead or social's dead or advertising's dead. The reality is, is, is different channels do different things. And so what works is basically getting stuff into a channel that's going to be viewed by your audience that they find valuable. Yeah. That's what works. So if you're going to do a webinar and it's just going to be a, a puffy piece, you know, promoting your product, it's probably going to suck. And it's probably going to actually be worse now than it was nine, 10 months ago when people weren't quite so hacked off with all the webinars there are. Yeah. If you create a webinar that is absolutely awesome, that covers exactly what people want to know, it's probably going to be great as long as you tell those people that you want to attend. So I think it's about matching not only the channel, but also the content. And obviously, getting the content right in the right channel is important. You know, I, I mean, inviting people to a five-minute webinar, probably not a great idea, particularly as, you know, a lot of people turn up late for webinars. But, you know, equally sending an email that's, um, you know, going to take you 20 minutes to read and you have to scroll through 50 pages, again, not the right channel, obviously. Um, yeah. What you have to do is you have to pick 
what you're going to send, make sure it's valuable, and then send it through the right channel. And don't imagine that there's a magic bullet. And I think this is this is one of the things you're you're kind of hinting is, you know, is there a perfect channel? The answer is no. It absolutely depends on what you're trying to do. And typically, our best campaigns actually don't use one magic channel. They use multiple channels. Um, and that's what works far better than trying to rely on one particular approach. So you might, for example, um, if you're trying to reach companies that you don't know, you might want to use LinkedIn. You know, you know the company names, you don't know the people. So um, that's a great way to go reach um, people at particular companies um, because you can advertise to you know individuals with certain job titles or job roles at a particular company. Mm-hmm. Alternative, if you want to reach your existing customers, that same ca- campaign is probably going to be running far more effectively if you run it through email. So it, it's about picking the right thing for the right, the right campaign. Oh my gosh. Yay. So as a content marketer at heart, everything you're saying is just resonating so much. So I've always believed in a value first approach and offering a way to solve a problem that maybe isn't necessary with the product. We had a guest on Daryl Evans who really pushed this. And I, I just love that. So we've had various webinars and anything that's super product centric, which we don't do, at least not anymore, never lands well. Mm -hmm. But like you said, if we can bring something valuable, like uh, how to fix your underlying data and get it ready, the the nerdy audience that we have, no offense, nerds, because I am one (laughs) of you, they just love it. And we get a lot of interaction on the webinar itself. And I also like how you were pointing out that if you do anything poorly, it's not going to hit well. It, it's really all about value first and then executing really well. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. I, and I think, you know, thinking about the value is really important. So, I, I mean, here's a great example. If you want to reach um, electronics engineers who are designing with microcontrollers, that's kind of the brains inside all these bits of electronic equipment. The thing to do is go to a trade show and go to a trade show in Nuremberg in June. It's actually been delayed since February this year. There's a show called Embedded World. It is the best trade show. And you'll reach a huge proportion of the German market there and probably do better than than maybe many other channels. You won't reach anybody really who's based in the UK. It might be one or two, but it'd be pretty small. It's mainly a German audience, but absolutely trade shows still work. But if you go to the trade show, you've got nothing useful to say. You've got nothing to show. The audience doesn't know you. I mean, be prepared to stand around on a booth for three days getting very bored. You've really got to think about what value you're adding and why the customers you want to talk to should come onto your booth and then build a booth around that. And it's not just flashy graphics. It's all about what are you doing to to help those visitors to trade show do their job better. Yeah, and I've always thought that if you're going to invest in a trade show, really start putting effort into um, pitching panel ideas, trying to get eloquent speakers on your team in front of people at the show itself, or at least get a PR strategy that pushes a lot of thought leadership content that might inspire people to come and and check things out. I, I don't think that going there with a well-designed booth is, <laughs> it's just not enough of a strategy, right? Absolutely. I love that, Kamala. And, and, and you're obviously an expert on Embedded World in Germany because actually <laughs> there's a huge conference part of that, that show. And if you get in the conference, it makes a massive difference to how you're perceived and you get to reach the most important people by being in the conference. So, you know, you're absolutely right. But equally, you don't have to do things like that. You can do really simple things. We had a client who went to a trade show and we said, right, we're going to do an ebook. You've done some um, blog posts and they're called Back to Basics. We're going to put it together. We're going to do a book on the basics of power system design. We'll build a book and it, you can just hand it out as a gift for people to help them design power systems. And they were like, well, you know, everything's on the blog. It's all free. And and to be quite honest, it's a bit white knuckle for us. We were like, we think this is going to work, but, you know, it's yeah, all on the yeah. blog. It's all free. Um, and it turned out to be a fantastic giveaway. People loved it. Um, yeah. And so much so that they did a lot of online promotion of electronic version of the book afterwards. So it's all about something that can help people. And And we actually did some research subsequently and found that one of the trends in their industry was more and more people who weren't specialists had to do this particular bit of, of engineering. And so actually, there was a huge demand. And, and so we were maybe kind of lucky that we timed it right with a change in the industry. But it, it certainly was uh, you know, a really successful thing. So I think think about you know what you're going to give people that's going to really make them go away and do something differently and do something better after the show. And if you can do that, people will remember you. Yeah, art and science. It's, it's always an art and science. So we hear what works, but if we don't execute well and understand our audience, it's just much more... A, of a dark art, missed art. (laughs) 
So direct mail was gaining steam. So we did it way back in the day and then we came back to it in 2019. It was gaining a lot of steam and I'm a sucker for succulents myself. So I get those little (laughs) plants and or somebody wants to buy me coffee. I always want coffee. Sure thing. So direct mail It's a little tricky now that everyone's at home. I know some platforms have devised a way where people can anonymously put in their home address and still receive the package. Do you see a time and a place for direct mail or do you think that's just not where people are right now? That's another really interesting trend. I think what we saw before the pandemic was that um, direct mail was becoming more of an ABM tactic than a, a general um, kind of broadcast tactic. Yeah. And absolutely, that that's the right thing. And, you know, I come from a marketing background. I know a lot of your listeners are salespeople. Okay, salespeople, you were right on that one. I'll admit that. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> we were we were sending out, you know, I, I mean, 10, 20 years ago, we were sending out all these, these um, mailers to people. It was crazy. We should be just focused down and do something really good for the biggest uh, customers. So clearly, that's what's happened. I think there is a real challenge with people working from home. And obviously, you know, now we're seeing people starting to go back. It's getting a bit easier. But frankly, you know, to me, it's like things like chocolate really make a big difference to me. Send me big bars of chocolate. Absolutely love it. People send me a bar of chocolate. That surprise, that excitement is is fantastic. If people send me an email saying, can you enter your home address? That kind of doesn't do it for me. And I'm much less excited. And I think there's, there's a real challenge of, being able to send to people's home addresses, and that is going to be difficult. And there's never going to be a way around it other than building your own data set of what people's home addresses are. And certainly there there are ways to do this and there are ways to do this that, that are GDPR compliant. And in Europe, you know, we care about GDPR, although obviously in the States you've got, you know, various laws like in, in uh, California. Um, well, we still care effect. about GDPR because <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter if anybody's interacting with us who's in the EU, we still have to care about it. So if, if, if you don't care about it out there, start caring. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and there's, there's other problems as well. So, I mean, if you're sending from the States, there's issues about, you know, the cost of import duty. And we even have that now in the UK since Brexit. Yes. Um, it's now become actually very difficult to send something from the UK to Europe mm-hmm. without someone ending up with a bill. And that never works well. It's like, we really like you to be a customer, but here's a bill first for you to pay. <laughs> um, and then you might get something that kind of is okay, you know. And so it, it's really challenging. And I think uh, I think trying to work around these these regional differences is really tough at the moment. It's making it more difficult. So, I mean, I would love like postal to come back. I think, you know, some of the most creative stuff was postal. Um, some of the most fun stuff was postal. Yeah. One of our best postal campaigns actually it was a little bit embarrassing. We went to pitch a client who we'd initially approached the postal mailer and we came back and, and the pitch team were there. And I was like, we have smashed this. We've we've won this business. It's fantastic. You know, and we walked in and the whole office laughed at us. And we're like, what's going on? What's going on? And they said, just want you to know, the client has posted a blog and they've said that they've chosen us because of the mailer. And all we did was we sent them a pebble from the beach and we just said, choose an agency of stones throw away. And they just loved the fact it was different and creative and fun mm-hmm. and, you know, all the rest of it. So um, I think, you know, postal mailers can be great. Mm-hmm. I'm going to I'm gonna miss them. I really hope, you know, to some extent we do get back more to the office because it's going to allow us to do more in post. At the moment, there is a there is for sure a bigger wastage because people are remote. Hi, I'm Kamala Thompson, Director of Growth at Caliber Mind. A lot of times we talk to prospects and they're excited about modernizing their marketing analytics, but they're worried about the data underneath. And that's a valid concern. That's why we came up with our Back to Basics Boot Camp to help you address all of the issues that stand in the way of you and insights that actually make sense. We'll meet each month to review a best practice. In addition to that, you'll walk away with handouts that go through how to implement each piece and a Slack channel where you can ask experts on demand about your organization, your processes, your system. I know it sounds too good to be true, but it's free and product agnostic, and we really suggest that you take us up on it. The program starts on February 8th, 2022, and space is limited. So register today at calibermind.com. Yeah, and what I'm seeing do really well right now are e-gift cards. So if there's some kind of coffee chain or, or something along those lines that is in their area that they can reimburse themselves instead of having to receive a package, it's... I still get excited for coffee. Like, I'll take coffee. It's good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my only thing I'd say is, 
don't run a European campaign. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, you think it's easy, right? We'll just buy a Starbucks e-gift card. Yeah. Okay. Starbucks cards only work in the country that they're issued in, basically, in yeah. Europe. I mean, it's not quite the same, but... Oh, no, you'd you buy, have to do your research and figure yeah, out what's If you buy a UK local. one, doesn't work in Germany. And in fact, in Germany, they don't do e-gift cards. They do physical gift cards. You have to get a physical gift card and send it. And it's actually remarkably tough to get the e-gift card working across borders. Wow. Um, and you have to really think country by country. And, and I'll be honest, we've got burned on that in one of our campaigns where we, we actually ended up with um, with some uh, people actually ending up with Amazon vouchers rather than Starbucks because we just couldn't uh, couldn't get them a Starbucks voucher without you know pretty much flying to the country, buying a physical Starbucks voucher and then posting it to them. Wow. Well, you can tell where I spend all my time advertising. <laughs> It's always good to hear what's not working elsewhere. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. uh, and also Starbucks in Italy is never a good idea. I mean, yeah, send, sending an Italian to a Starbucks is probably not going to build the relationship. So that's another issue as well. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true, true. So I think a lot of us saw GDPR roll out, and it, it was this moment of truth where we realized we'd overstepped our boundaries in advertising. People were irritated and uh, first party data collection was going to go under a lot more rigor and become a lot more necessary. So giving people things of value, information that they can use within their own organization and motivating them to interact with us proactively and sign up for interactions is great. Now, you you already mentioned a couple ways around this that can be effective and drive people to engage with you there, and that was LinkedIn. Are you seeing other ways that people can start building their database if they haven't already? Yeah, so I think you're absolutely right. Building the database is, is important. And actually, and this maybe is a geeky GDPR thing, but when you look at GDPR, you read the regulations. You talk about geeks. I've read the GDPR regulations. I can't say I'm a lawyer, but I've read them. Yeah. One of the big things is actually disclosure. And it's about being clear about what you're doing with the data, what data you're collecting. Yep. And that to me is fascinating because with GDPR, it's very easy to write a privacy policy that makes it 10 times as hard to gather data than if you write a much more flexible privacy policy. And, and yes, consumer uh, business consumer uh, companies have it much harder, to be honest. But B2B can be much more flexible in how their policies are written. And they can use what's called legitimate interest. And we see some clients coming in and they've got like, we're only doing double opt-in and we're only doing this, we're only doing that. And, and their databases you know, are not growing. Um, mm-hmm. And we've got other clients who they're still behaving very ethically. So mm-hmm. they're, they're maybe having an opt-in or maybe they're not, maybe they're just doing opt-out. And that's not possible now across the whole of Europe um, to just do opt-out. But actually, yeah. you know, from different places it is. So in many countries in Europe, the GDPR interpretation allows you to do opt-out. They're allowing people to opt-out whenever. They're, they're making it clear what they're doing. They're allowing people to go to preference centers, get the data they want, and they're growing their database. And actually, the really interesting thing is the people on their database love the communications. Mm-hmm. Um, and if we look at our database, we do we, we do basically take people off who are not interacting um, with our emails, but we get somewhere between 40 and 50% open rates on our emails. And, and frankly, you know, if we don't get 40% open rate, I'm freaking out. You know, I really want more than 50. And we do get 50 on some, you know, more than 50 on some emails. And it's because we're sending things that people care about to the people who care about them. That's it. It's, it's a really simple recipe. And I think what's happened in terms of growing that, that database is that we're moving away from volume as being the metric. Having a database of a million or two million or three million actually may not be great. Or even, you know, for smaller businesses, a thousand may be crazy, maybe far too many. You know, the best example I give on volume is if you look at the Napier website, you know, we have thousands of visitors every month to our website. We could take on possibly two clients and onboard them and do a really good job of taking them on. So I actually only really care about two or three visitors a month. I mean, it's great other people are looking and it's great people are using it as a resource and it's good we're, we're raising awareness. But actually, the thing that really matters is a very, very small proportion of visitors. And I think it's the same with email databases. If you're mailing a million people, but only 10 buy, you only really care about those 10. And I think, you know, the other basically a million people are are really there for, for your ego and nothing else. So it's about focusing down on what really matters. 
and we're seeing more and more people segmenting databases. You know, people have always talked about segmenting, but now actually it's like, let's send it to people who care rather than, oh, let's just split it and say, well, these guys are in the industrial sector, so they'll all get this. It doesn't matter whether it's really relevant or not. I, I think it's really important to think about what you're doing. And so we are seeing marketing and sales coming closer together. Oh, yeah. Um, and ABM is, is, is a huge factor in that where you're saying, actually, we don't care about a million accounts or 100,000 accounts or 10,000 accounts. We care about this number here because that's what's going to move the needle for the business. And I think that's a fascinating trend that applies across a lot of marketing. Yeah, no, it's it's tough. But what I see a lot of times is a lot of companies, startups in the US, a lot of the people on the board have seen this volume model that they've implemented work. And that's, you have, you need so many targets, which turn into MQLs, this demand gen waterfall mindset. And it's really hard to convince people when they've, they've come from that volume mindset to switch to quality over quantity and start thinking about, okay, well, how many do I actually need to hit my number? And is it more efficient to just highly target things? So I hear people saying, well, instead of just highly targeting an ABM, let's let's target a few hundred companies <laughs> and, and do something in the middle. And to me, ABM works really well. Like you've been saying this entire time when it's highly targeted, the messaging is customized to the company and their particular plight. It's it's a tactic struggle where I'm seeing people struggling to move from that quantity to quality mindset. Are you seeing that too? in your neck of the woods or is it not resonating? I, I, I love the way you've talked about that, Camilla, because I think people look at the funnel and they assume the conversion rates are fixed in stone. Yes. Um, and, and actually, you know, it is so much easier often to double a conversion rate than double the number of people coming in the funnel. And yes. typically, if you double the number of people coming in the funnel, you halve the conversion rate anyway. So it's about quality. It's about quality at every stage. So it's not about, um, you know, just getting the best quality leads. It's about getting the best quality leads and then giving them the best experience, the best journey through. Um, and if you combine those two things, you're going to maximize your conversion rate and you're going to solve a lot of a lot of issues. So, you know, I mean, one example would be is, is we actually ended up turning down, um, I think it was about nine uh, potential clients in the last quarter of last year. Now, as I said, we, we could probably take on about six in a quarter anyway. So we actually turned down and declined to pitch about nine. And there were different reasons for some of them. Some of them we'd like to work with and they were conflicts and things. But what we weren't going to do is we weren't going to chase clients where either we weren't going to win or the value of the business wasn't going to be sufficient to make it worthwhile for us. And it's something, you know, we've been telling, you know, our clients for ages, you know, it's all about focus and making sure you improve quality and quality both in terms of experience and, and the the prospects coming in. And if you do that, that's going to, you know, help you be more efficient, more effective, and ultimately, you know, make more money. And finally, we're, we're actually listening to what we said. And it, it makes a big difference. It is hard when you get a tough quarter to turn people down. Yep. But actually, it's quite often the right thing to do. Yeah. And I, I think it's so hard for salespeople because they have to hit a number and they're thinking more at bats means more chances means higher probability of closing what I need to close. We're not thinking long range and particular the potential of back charges with people canceling and getting that commission canceled out. This kind of strategy is really thinking much longer term and whether or not that customer will be a champion, bring in additional customers with glowing reviews, those sorts of things. But I think, you know, you talk about at bats. And I'm, I'm English, but I vaguely understand the concept of baseball. It's it's like a bad version of cricket. <laughs> well, I was going to say cricket. You, you kind of have at. Is it at wickets? What is it? <laughs> but, but, but the idea of at bats is, is a great example because you know if I've not played since little league, and I'm 50 and I'm overweight, and you know it really doesn't matter how many at bats I have against a, a major league pitcher, I'm not going to even see the ball, let alone swing the bat in time to hit it. And I can as many as bats I like, I'm not going to score. So what you've got to do is pick where you can win. And maybe it's not against the top pitcher, or maybe you get someone in who's better to bat for you, you know. But it's about finding those ways to to really identify what causes you to win and then making sure that you actually do things that have a good chance of winning. Um, and it is painful. I totally agree. I mean I've I've been in sales as well as in marketing. 
And, you know, it's almost alien to a salesperson to, to want to turn down an opportunity, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. And I think it's, you know, how do you improve that, that funnel? How do you improve those conversion rates? And how do you improve the quality of the people coming in? The actual number, it's just vanity. As an APR, if I need two clients a month, it really doesn't matter whether I'm putting 20 people in that funnel every month or 200 or 2,000 or 2 million. It's going to make no difference at all. It's just going to basically clog up my um, uh, CRM system with more and more people that I actually am never going to sell to. Yeah, it's just putting more uh, hay in that haystack where you're trying to find that one needle. It's just confusing yeah. the overall picture. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Fun. Obviously, you know, if anyone would, would like any information about, you know, what we're doing or particularly, you know, it, I know you have a lot of listeners in America. If they'd like to understand a little bit about Europe, I, I'd love them to, you know, drop me a line. Be very happy to talk to them. Great. Wonderful. And I'm hearing two huge takeaways. So if you haven't started a first party database with information following regulations, today's the day to start. Start researching how to come up with a privacy policy and a data policy and figure out how to implement that in your systems. And then the second thing is if you're not offering value, no one's going to engage with you anyway. So start with that piece and figuring out who your audience is and what they want to see. Yes. Absolutely. And the first party data, I mean, you talked about home addresses can have home addresses in. We send, um, we send cakes to clients. I mean, we, we love cakes and we, we've got a, a baker who will bake us cakes and she's baked us cakes and done chocolates, all sorts of amazing things we send clients. And believe me, you know, we ask the clients, so we like to send you something. They're normally very happy. When they receive the cake, they're always happy. They've given up the address. So I, I don't think be scared about asking for data, even when it feels quite personal, like home addresses. Because if you're adding value, and because I'm not baking the cake, the cake is definitely adding value, it's definitely something to do. Be brave about asking for information and then use it ethically. And I think you'll find it's, it's a really valuable way to approach things. Really, if you're doing it ethically, the worst thing people can say is no. So exactly. it's worth a shot. So Mike, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Where can people find you online to network? Thanks, Kamala. I mean, people can obviously find me on LinkedIn. I'm the only Mike Maynard at Napier, um, so that's an easy way to find me. Or, you know, if anybody has any questions, you know, I love talking to people, just send me an email. My email is mike at napierb2b.com. Wonderful. And for those of you listening to the podcast, if you enjoy it, please rate, review, subscribe, tell a couple friends about it. Those shares really matter. And for those of you looking for more great content like this, check out calvermind.com.